Good uh, morning, everybody, and thank y'all for being here. I know there's a lot going on, so we had several uh, folks who sent their regrets that they would not be able to join us today, but I'm excited because um, we've got a, a full agenda. Um, shouldn't take us um, more than our allotted hour, but um, but I think got some really good information. I know we've talked uh, several times about housing trust funds, and so uh, we do have um, Mr. Michael Anderson here, who is the director of housing trust funds for community change, that is going to make a presentation. So before um, we go into that. Uh, well, I guess, Erica, I don't know if I officially call this meeting to order, but I'm officially calling this meeting to order uh, and would like to, to entertain a motion for approval of our September 14th minute. I motion approval. Okay, Ms. Matthews, um, motion for approval. Is there a second? <laughs> Ms. Bino Reed, second. All those in favor, either signal by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All right, great. Well, our minutes for September 14th are approved. Uh, if we could move forward. Jim, uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce um, Mr. Anderson for us, please? I certainly will. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce Michael Anderson. He's with Community Change. Our group met him years ago now uh, when we were researching uh, solutions to the housing problem. Uh, in Richland County in the city of Columbia. And uh, Michael was a uh, just a, a great resource for um, solutions to the housing problem. And um, I'd like to welcome Michael to our task force. Michael. Good morning, everyone, or a good afternoon, I should say. Um, I guess it's 11 for you all. I'm on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, so it's 8. For me, I've uh, just enjoyed my coffee and I'm excited to be with you all. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, housing trust funds and particularly the impact of housing trust funds uh, in Richland County uh, in the city of Columbia. Uh, but before I jump in, let me say a little bit more uh, to introduce myself. Um, uh, for the last uh, 12 years, I have directed the housing trust fund project for community change. Community Change is a national nonprofit that was formed after the assassinations of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy to fulfill not just their vision, but the vision of so many of a world where all of us, but particularly people of color and people of low incomes, have the tools and agency that they need to shape the communities that they live in. And part of that strategy for the past 35 years has been working with state and local efforts to create or to expand this model called the Housing Trust Fund. I'm gonna uh, pull up a slide deck here and take us through a presentation, and then we should have plenty of time uh, uh, for conversation uh, and questions. I would say though, if I'm moving through my presentation and there is a question, you know, I welcome you to, uh, to raise your hand up and ask it. And if I don't see it right away, because Sometimes when the presentation's up on these Zooms, it's hard to see. Um, just speak up and get my attention. Uh, I think we, we have enough time here to cover all the material. So I believe I should be able to share screen. There we go. And um, let me do this here. All right. So as I said, I'm uh, very glad to be with you all here to talk about this model. The Housing Trust Fund, uh, as I will get into, there's a, um, both um, some methodology to it and reason why this is such an effective tool, but also it's a fairly simple prospect on the top of it, which is to say that a housing trust fund created by ordinance or legislation commits public dollars to meet the identified affordable housing needs of a community. So let me catch up to my slides here. So uh, when we think of affordable housing trust funds, what we think about is the most popular strategy that cities and counties use in the United States to bring in public revenue to affordable housing deals to actually do what the community uh, most genuinely needs. Affordable housing trust funds can do a range of things, 
But in fact, in South Carolina, um, it's, it's defined pretty uh, uh, um, uh, definitely by what's called the Measure Act. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then we're gonna get into this larger world of what housing trust funds could do uh, and the impact that they have in communities. So um, the Measure Act, which is state law in South Carolina, allows for cities, counties uh, to create uh, um, housing trust funds or to participate in housing trust funds, specifically to advance the development or rehabilitation of affordable housing. So back to the very simple core of this, this is a tool intended to fuel uh, the development and whenever we talk about real estate, whether we're talking about the highest end houses or whether we're talking about multifamily apartments, real estate always costs money. There's no shortcut to it. Um, the uh, uh, Measure Act also um, is pretty specific about uh, the type of revenue that communities can bring in. I'm going to get to that later on in the presentation. Um, but suffice it to say that the key to a housing trust fund is not just the structures of what it's supposed to achieve, but the fact that it, there is money in it so it can produce. So to say it in another way, you can have the nicest car in the world, but if it's parked in your driveway with no gas, it's not gonna take you anywhere. So when we think about housing trust funds, it's not just what are they supposed to do, is where is that fuel coming through the trust fund so it can produce the results that it's capable of. Um, all right, so I, I think you all might be treated here. I have uh, two new kittens in my house and I cannot keep them away from my work area. So hopefully they won't be too disruptive. I do see them making their rounds. Um, so housing trust funds are in, in its simplest terms, how local government pays for affordable housing, especially the type of housing that they need. We know that state uh, uh, programs and more importantly, federal programs were not necessarily put together with Columbia or Richland County in mind. It's more the big urban or East Coast or West Coast cities. At the same time, we know for working families, uh, in Richland County, for seniors living on disability, for young parents just getting starting out. The money that they have in their pocketbook does not match the rents that they're being asked to pay. And it's not a problem that has been staying still, it's a problem that's been growing, and not just in Richland County, around the nation. So this is a crucial time for you all to be having this discussion about what can we do uh, um, in the city, what can we do in Richland County to begin to uh, allow our, our fellow uh, uh, um, members of the county to, to keep their feet rooted uh, in the place they love, in the place that they call home. Um, Trust funds are an extremely uh, prolific, popular model for addressing affordable housing. This movement started in um, the early 80s and has grown steadily through good times and bad times in the economy. Because housing trust funds deliver, because it is a way for a local government to have control over federal, state, and philanthropic resources in a way that allows for planning and execution of an affordable housing strategy over time. So as more and more communities see that success and communities nearby and, and from around the country uh, witness it and say, we wanna do that too. That's the story of the growth of the housing trust fund movement. It is this, uh, a story of success and solutions that keeps building on each other. Um, Almost every state in this country um, has a local or state housing trust funds. Uh, uh, South Carolina, um, uh, actually, uh, I need to update this slide. I just noticed because we have the Greenville Housing Trust Fund. Um, no, we're, we're still at one. I was, for some reason, all of a sudden, I was thinking that the South Carolina Community Loan Fund uh, um, was, was online and functioning, but it's missing the money, the money resources, similar to Midlands. This isn't to say that those two trust funds haven't done some things in the community, but this fundamental purpose, going back to the Measure Act, to serve households with a preference of below 50% area median income, that takes public money. There's no shortcut to figuring out where that subsidy comes from. Uh, at the same time, the, what trust funds, the, their success and uh, uh, their popularity is because they deliver. 
they are able to do serve the people that other tools in the community are unable to. Um, so as I said, uh, trust funds have continued even during this uh, uh, very strange period in our country with the pandemic and the economic challenges that have uh, uh, rolled out of that. We have seen across the country uh, new communities uh, stepping up to create housing trust funds. Um, Fort Myers, Florida, uh, uh, Hillsborough County, Florida, and Winter Haven, Florida, for a period of time, uh, just as recently as three years ago, uh, um, the state of Florida had two operational housing trust funds in the state. Now, all of a sudden, that number has more than doubled. And again, it speaks to uh, both the opportunity when you create a trust fund to be able to meet the challenges in the community, but also how success breeds success as Hillsborough County enacted the housing trust fund, it inspired the conversations and the imaginations in both Fort Myers and, and Winter Haven. Winter Haven, which most recently became a housing trust fund, is using funding from um, the American Rescue Plan, from the state and local government uh, um, uh, um, rescue money uh, to fuel their trust fund and, and get it operational out of the bank to put that first full tank of gas in the car and uh, and really take it out uh, uh, for a spin. But we've also seen uh, Missoula, Montana, Knoxville, Tennessee, Albemarle County, uh, Virginia, all create new trust funds. Richmond, Virginia, which has had a trust fund for a while, but uh, uh, um, uh, more than tripled the amount of money uh, that they are committing to it from uh, about 2 million and change uh, to 10 million annually. Again, using American rescue funds, as well as other local revenue sources uh, uh, to hit a mark that really meets the challenges that Richmond families face uh, each month when the rent check comes due. Um, so local housing trust funds, why, why their success? And you know, I talked about it at a high level, but now I wanna get a little bit more into the details because local housing trust funds are able to do things that oftentimes uh, um, seem undoable otherwise. Um, this gentleman that we're looking at here, um, he's from a small town in South Dakota. And uh, when he was born, he was born with certain cognitive challenges that meant for his whole life, his parents needed to take care of him. But as we know, anyone who they themselves and their family has a child with, with challenges or they have it in their broader family, parents get older. And at some point, that adult child needs a level of care that their parents can no longer provide. But in South Dakota, there was really no place for him. So he wound up living in hospitals and institutions until South Dakota passed its housing trust fund. And in the first round of funding was created uh, uh, adult uh, apartments for adults with disabilities uh, like Ralph here. And for the first time in his whole life, Ralph had his own room. And I show this picture, uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of Lone Ranger and Tonto, but I'll tell you this, those are Ralph's decorations. He put that up on his wall. It was his first time that he had that opportunity. What an incredible thing that that housing trust fund allowed for him. And it's not just people like Ralph. It's our, our uh, seniors who are uh, expecting and hoping to age with uh, dignity uh, and, and peace of mind, uh, having that comfort to, that they can stay in a community. Um, it's for young families starting out, uh, when pocketbooks are often the tightest, uh, um, being able to give it a go, to thrive, to get to that, that exciting stage where both the kids are getting older and the parents are earning more. Um, we know that, for, um, to, uh, that housing trust funds create housing that's accessible for a range of different abilities and challenges that allow for full participation for people who otherwise are, are cordoned off or not uh, given the full opportunity to participate, including in the place that they live. We know that um, people experiencing homelessness is a challenge around the country, all sorts of people, uh, uh, certainly veterans, certainly families, the list can go on. But we also know that housing trust funds are a proven solution that creates housing uh, that allows people, even in these challenging circumstances, to get back up on their feet, to find that stability and to find a way to thrive. So housing trust funds um, contain several uh, um, core elements, best practice elements that allow them to deliver these results. Um, the first is 
where is the housing trust fund administered or who runs it? And again, this is where the Measure Act comes in. For South Carolina, the uh, requirement is that there is a nonprofit entity that would run the housing trust fund that would administer uh, how the funds uh, flow, how people apply for them, make sure the funds are going to the right place. And in this light, we, we of course have uh, uh, in, in your region, the Midlands uh, Affordable Housing tr uh, 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 Trust Fund. Again, the challenge with the Midlands Trust Fund is it's never had the resources in it, but also um, that, well, I'm gonna come back in a second to that. I'll, I'll go one step at a time. But then the next piece is, is related to oversight. Um, and this is a, a, another place where the Measure Act speaks and says that each year trust funds need to do a report on what they do and how those resources were used. This is a really important part of what makes trust funds work. You need, there's a compact with the public whenever you talk about using tax dollars and public money. And oftentimes I think the public gets frustrated in situations where they see their resources go, go into things where it wasn't intended or, or they don't feel like they, there was a delivery of bang for the buck. Well, housing trust funds, not just in South Carolina, but definitely in South Carolina, have a built-in response to this, which is to actually actively report on how the money was spent and to do it in a way, when you look at trust fund reports from around the country, to do it in a way that really lifts up the story of the impact in the community. And this is why when we look at that number of 800 housing trust funds, there's probably less than 30 over the last three and a half decades that have folded up. Without exception, those ones that have not continued on, the trust funds that have not functioned over time, that's because they never put any money. It was just a car sitting in the driveway. And after a while, you get tired of that. But all the other trust funds where the money's flown through, the results are clear, the community loves it, and they become more popular over time. The area that's probably the most fun to think about housing trust funds is what do they do? What, what impact are they going to make? What are the highest priorities in the community? And certainly the focus on the preservation and, uh, and the rehabilitation and new construction of affordable housing uh, is the core activities that trust funds do across the country. But they often do other activities that augment that, such as allowing for uh, the purchase of land that would later be used for affordable housing or making pre-development funds available so that nonprofit and other mission-driven de uh, developers have the resources on the front end uh, uh, as do private developers in order to uh, uh, be entrepreneurial, seize opportunities, move projects forward. Um, down to when we talk about housing trust funds that are successful working with people who are homeless, um, having some funding that uh, connects for services that support those people so that they can thrive once they get into housing, and many activities in between. All of these activities are the choice of the local community making it. That is, again, one of the, the reasons that trust funds are so popular is that it is a vehicle for local control. So there's a menu of 16, 18 different things that trust funds do around the country. But for a trust fund that was to serve Richland County, for a trust fund that was to serve Columbia, it would be up to you all to say, well, what does that trust fund need to do? What are the activities that ours needs to focus its resources and energy on? The next gets into who are the people served by the trust funds. And trust funds, this is answered in two major ways. One, looking at what, are, what is the income levels of the people served. And then the others are, is our trust funds that focus and give priority to certain populations. So I say young families, uh, um, seniors, uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness. Uh, it could be a range of things that the local community says, hey, this is where we really want to make a difference. So to give an example, in Kalamazoo County, Michigan, it is a county that has had a long uh, legacy of um, caring about children's educational outcomes. Now, every place cares about children's educational outcomes. But in Kalamazoo County, there's a particular uh, uh, philanthropist 
who a while back did something called uh, the Promise for Kalamazoo. I might be calling the name slightly wrong, but basically what it said is, if you can graduate high school in Kalamazoo County, you can get a scholarship to the state, a state school, a tremendous opportunity. But the people in Kalamazoo County began to realize when families were struggling to keep themselves uh, uh, stably housed because of rising rent prices and their kids all of a sudden were shuffling between their aunt's house, a motel, that horrible night in the car, the educational outcomes for the younger students were beginning to put that, the, these young minds in a place where graduating college was the farther and farther away. I mean, high school was farther and farther away. So this promise was a promise that they could not get. So what happened is uh, a, a group of, of uh, uh, churches and congregations uh, got together and worked with the county officials and the city officials over time and created a housing trust fund that specifically serves families with children enrolled in, the, in public schools in Kalamazoo County who are on the verge of homelessness or experiencing homelessness. And that passed in 2013. And actually it went to the vote and people voted a property tax on themselves. 51% of the people voted a property tax on themselves to pay for this new idea. Well, it was so successful that last November in 2020, that tax, the voters agreed at over 54% to increase that tax on themselves by seven times. The reason they did it is because it was working, because the lives of families in Kalamazoo County were changing. Opportunity that had been shut off was opening up. So when we think about who a trust fund can serve, that that um, focus that uh, ties to the, the local uh, culture, the local flavors, uh, um, the, the sensibilities, that is what really unlocks trust funds and why we see that popularity, because it both has a structure, but then an ability when we think about who are we going to serve and how are we going to serve them? Is this going to be a home ownership initiative? Is this going to be creating more apartments that are affordable uh, to people at the very lowest incomes? All of that is the decision of the locality. There's more details around best practices, such as deciding who's eligible to apply for the funds. In most cases, uh, uh, um, nonprofit and for-profit developers are allowed. Uh, um, in many cases, housing authorities. Again, these are decisions that get informed by what you all know locally and what you know would work best uh, in, in, in your area. Um, then there's also parts to housing trust funds that take federal programs and look at some of what I'll describe as their weaknesses and make them stronger. So the best example that I have of this is many federal housing programs that give public money to developers only require those developers to keep the property affordable for 15 years, in some cases 20 years. Well, most housing trust funds say, if you get a dollar of the housing trust fund, as part of your financing package, you need to keep that affordable for 30 years. Well, that's more than just twice as long, because if you think of families living in an apartment for maybe four or five years, all of a sudden, instead of serving three or four families, you're serving six to eight families. That's generational change that a trust fund can create for a community. It's not just one apartment. It's that apartment in the public covenant over time and, and the difference that that can make for the options that a community has for people to live, especially people at the lowest income. Finally, we're going to talk about um, the dedicated revenue. Um, this, is, you know, this is the gas in the car. And ideally, uh, trust funds have uh, um, gas that each year you get your tank fully filled up, you drive it down, you come back the next year, you get that same predictable full tank of gas uh, to work with. And um, there are uh, um, certainly a lot examples of trust funds that don't find this sort of gold standard of the dedicated revenue. 
um, and do more of a model of ongoing revenue. So to give you an example of the difference between those two, in Kalamazoo County, even though they have to renew it for seven years, the fact that that property tax, that they know it's there for each year, we call that dedicated annual revenue. If we look at a city like Louisville, Kentucky, they've for the last four years committed between um, six and 10 million annually from their general fund. We call that ongoing revenue. Uh, both are good strategies. The difference is in Louisville every year around the budget, there's another big debate going over the, all the same important facts um, that Louisville has some real housing challenges and the housing trust fund is their best way to address them. A dedicated revenue um, is, it's, is um, puts the community in a position uh, not to have a new debate every year, but actually to execute a multi-year plan, to be able to say that, okay, Columbia is not going to uh, uh, solve all its affordable housing challenges, Richland County is not going to solve all its challenges um, in nine months or in 18. But if we can know that we have this much annually to work with in our budget, we can enact a strategy over 10 years. We can do things that are gonna lay the foundation that the, the problems that families face now, finding an affordable place to live will become part of the past. Because once you start developing and building up the infrastructure that is online and affordable over time, that's all of a sudden where you begin to tip the scales and change the prospects for those people who are at the very, very lowest income. Um, but it's a big deal to talk about public revenue yeah, um, and, uh, and the Measure Act, which I'm going to uh, get back to in a moment here, um, speaks specifically in terms of what type of revenue. That said, I want to be clear about why it's so important that we have this ongoing revenue uh, in an affordable housing trust fund. The first is that for communities to thrive, the people who live in those communities have to have some options that fit within their pocketbook. Um, the stress alone for parents of wondering, am I going to be able to put it all together this month? Hey, hey can I skip my utility bill or delay it? Because I have the, it's a hot month. I got all the air conditioning bills and other of the utility bills. That kind of day-to-day -day life um, is horribly taxing on parents and on anyone, really. Uh, speaking of people in their golden years of retirement, it's another thing. Why, why, why do we have people experiencing uh, that kind of unrest? And that's just the stress part of it, because oftentimes it doesn't just work out. Then there's the reality of what do we do as we're scrambling. And so for a, for a community to be healthy, for the fabric of a community to be durable, people need to have a place within their price range to afford to live. The second thing is the private market is not going to step in here. The purpose of the private development market is to make money. And if that's not going to change. That is the purpose of it. So when we think about the housing that's not being created by the market, that's where the public subsidies come in. And it's the lowest income households. And the reason is, is because that doesn't generate a lot of money. It doesn't generate a lot of profits. So the third is, and this gets to the planning factor, to execute, and, and this, this body of folks, you are all intimately involved with what the challenges are for Columbia. You've looked at the numbers, you've crunched the challenges, you've examined solutions. You know that the reason that you're all together is because your collective brain power, putting the different pieces of the puzzle together, being able to try to figure out what are the strategies that we can act. Um, it's hard work. There's a lot of moving pieces. Having a housing trust fund that has predictable, dedicated, ongoing revenue allows bodies like yours, allows government officials, allows county and city departments to execute a plan over time. Because when we think about affordable housing development, and I'm probably telling you all something you all know, the financing alone uh, takes sometimes years to put together. Um, so if you know at the beginning when you're approaching, say, a tax credit deal and trying to get tax, federal tax credits from the state awarded, if you know that the trust fund is going to have resources for you come 2022 
uh, um, that puts you in such a more competitive position to get those tax credits, to get the other federal resources, other state resources, because the full financing package is there. You can predict it. You can talk about how it would all come together. And then finally, affordable housing cannot be relying on budget surpluses. When our communities need uh, uh, housing trust funds the most, new resources for housing the most, um, is oftentimes when we're very far from a surplus. So that's why um, the totality of those four reasons is really cements um, this, this reasoning of why we need ongoing dedicated funding. So there are examples of revenue um, from cities and counties. There are some that are very popular. There's some that only one or two places do. This list is a little bit of, of a difficult list to uh, um, share in the sense that um, for the Measure Act, there's a real limit in what kind of funding um, a locality can enact. The, um, the act is very specific about both bond revenues um, and grants and loans from state and federal sources, um, but, um, but other resources of how, how you would commit them, general fund is on the table. Uh, and then um, uh, Charleston uh, County went to the ballot, got very, very, very close. Uh, um, in um, dedicating, um, oh, I'm going to call it out wrong. I want to say it's their public purpose tax, but I'm, uh, um, but uh, a tax that was already uh, uh, being assessed, committing a, a, a portion of it um, to the uh, housing trust fund. So there are avenues uh, in South Carolina for sure to put the revenue in, uh, into the housing trust funds, and. Um, and again, that's really the determinant of what's going to make the trust fund go. When the trust fund does go, uh, it, it acts like a magnet. It begins to bring in other resources, state, federal, and local, to be able to now do the things that Richland County, that Columbia has identified as the highest priorities. And we call this leveraging. Um, in our survey of uh, city and county housing trust funds, we found that city for every dollar that a city housing trust fund invests, uh, uh, six dollars uh, come, uh, additional dollars come into that city for affordable housing development. Uh, at the county level, for every dollar, eight dollars and fifty cents. This is an example of how, when you put money into a local housing trust fund, it begins to drive the results of how all the other money is used. So it both brings in money that might not have otherwise come to a locality, but even for the money that was going to come in, it makes that those resources more precisely align with what are the things that need to happen locally, what are the priorities that have been uh, developed. Um, so finally, I'm going to close out my comments talking about uh, um, uh, some of the trends that we've seen um, with housing trust funds. Uh, one is, so when you think about how much resources that you need for a housing trust fund, um, that question um, is often um, more about political will than it is about need. There's no question. Um, I, so in the studying that I've done of uh, Columbia and Richland County, um, I think the county could have a housing trust fund that had $10 million a year flowing through it and easily easily deploy that money into the community with great impact. Politics is probably, we're not in that 10 million range. Um, but one of the strategies of getting there is to look at how can we layer multiple revenue sources? So we have the American uh, uh, Rescue Plan funds available right now. What a golden opportunity that communities across the country are beginning to take advantage of. Uh, um, that would be a great example of something that's totally eligible within the Measure Act that could really be that that first that first uh, tank of gas. And when we and and I'm telling you, maybe I'm going a little bit too too big on this car analogy. But when people start seeing seeing that car tooling around town, people are going to be impressed and say, "Hey, we need to get more gas in that car." Um, regional multi-jurisdictional housing trust funds. So in right Midlands. Uh, uh, housing trust fund is a regional housing trust fund. So this is a, a good thing in the sense of, you know, people don't just live in Columbia or just Richland County. I believe, and I'm going to forget, this is embarrassing, right? Because 
Columbia is actually in two counties, I believe. Uh, um, so, or on the edge of another county. So people live in regions, you know, that makes sense to have a, 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 a regional housing trust fund. However, the challenges of it, and, and we've seen this a little bit with, you know, how uh, 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 for, for Midlands, for the South Carolina Community Loan Fund, is that uh, often meeting the specific needs of a community, it's different, it's, it's difficult to do um, in, in, in a broad cross-regional approach. And so, uh, um, and still have the precision that each community needs. So I'm not suggesting that regional is the, is the direction that uh, um, you all would go, but just to say, this is a sensibility. And that's why I think thinking about Richland County wide, just like Charleston County was thinking with the cities within it, we need to do something county wide. It's, that's different than regional, but still I think a strategy that makes uh, an extraordinary amount of sense uh, uh, for uh, the Columbia Richland County uh, uh, region. And then I talked about winning at the ballot. And again, we, we know that um, that's not the, the, the end of the story of what happened in, in Charleston County uh, last, 20, uh, uh, last November uh, 2020. But that election night across the country, voters did support housing trust funds. Uh, Ch Charleston County was the tough story and it came within a percentage point much less than a percentage point of winning. So that might be something that's like, boy, we're not going to take this to the ballot. This guy doesn't know our area. What's he talking about? Well, what I am talking about is places that never thought it was possible when they explored it and, and, and actually tested it with the people did see that avenue to advance it and win. So again, I'm not trying to be directive in, in what the pathway here is, but to say that lane is more open than you think it is, especially with, with closer uh, inspection. So um, I said a lot, I talked for almost 40 minutes. I told myself I would be quicker than that, but um, I will now open it up to questions and in this presentation and I'm happy to have any kind of exchange with you on what I said, or if you have questions about things that I didn't bring up that you're interested in. Thank you, Michael. Um, Councilwoman Teresia has a question she put in the chat. Um, she just said that she was informed that ARP funds would be tricky since they all need to be spent within an allocated period of time. Um, is that something you could speak to? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's why housing trust funds are such a good vehicle for those funds because committing the funds to the trust fund meets the threshold of what the federal government expects. Once it's in the trust fund, it's already defined. It will be used for affordable housing that will be serving these income levels. That's the threshold that get the federal government I mean, we all know from affordable housing finance, even if literally they said you need to have this money and such and such that like somebody's going to get a key and open an apartment. Just the turnaround for that, if you were doing a direct allocation to a development deal, is longer than the timeline um, of turning around the money. So by that same uh, logic, if it's committed to a trust fund that already says, well, this is where it's going to go, that meets the threshold. And that's, you know, I mentioned the cities and counties from around the United States that have used this fund, all those cities and the counties have attorneys. <laughs> and they very much look to say, hey, is this the way these funds can be used? And the answer is definitively yes. Other questions? And I can't see everybody's screen. So if you want to just unmute yourself and jump in, you don't have to wait to be recognized. Michael, can you speak to uh, establishing a trust fund through a third party? Like uh, the um, city of Greenville did with using, um, I think it was Community Works. Yes. So the Measure Act, and this is something that's, that's different for South Carolina than uh, for um, any other state, which is that um, to have a trust fund in this state, it must be run by a non-governmental organization. Um, and so um, this uniqueness um, is also uh, an opportunity of for, so for community works uh, in Greenville, um, the, the purpose of uh, and mission of community works 
really aligned tightly with what the city of Greenville was hoping to achieve with their housing trust funds. And having that alignment, particularly around the income levels served, particularly, and this relates to the income levels, um, if you wanna serve people below 50% area median income, you really need to be doing it with grants. Loans don't work from a financing standpoint. Uh, and I don't know if it's exactly 50% AMI uh, in Richland County, it might be a little bit higher, but loans don't work uh, for the overall financing in terms of reducing rents once you get to a certain uh, a size of income level. So you, you need to have an organization um, that is aligned around these, uh, these goals and able to deliver around these goals. Um, I think that's, and so it's a combination of how, what the, how the trust fund is written. Um, and I, we recommend that it is as specific as it can be about what your goals around specific uh, um, income guidelines are. So who you want served. Um, and then you need to have a, a, that third party organization really being aligned and able to deliver uh, or, or at that income level. <clears throat> um, excuse me, I got a little frog in my throat. So <clears throat> I don't know, uh, Jim, if that's the full answer you want, or if you were wanting me to get into more detail. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Hey, this, this ahead, is Jennifer. Jennifer. hey, I had just a quick question. That's okay, Ms. Devine. Um, since we have an existing regional trust fund um, in Columbia, is that an opportunity to be a vehicle for possible dedicated resources from the city or the county? Um, or since it's regional, other counties as well, since we need housing in all areas of the Midlands for people? And that was just a quick question um, to, I had. Yeah, no, it's, that's a huge question and a very good one. And um, you all are closer. Uh, you, you are in Columbia. I'm in Portland. From my vantage point, as I've uh, uh, studied it and the discussions that I've been engaged in, I think there's a couple challenges with the ability to just directly put money in the Midlands uh, uh, um, Housing Trust Fund. The first is the income level served, is that the priorities for, you know, where the need is the greatest in Richland County and Columbia, um, what Midlands has been focusing on is income levels above that. The second thing is the loan and grant issue that uh, my understanding is that Midlands Housing Trust Fund um, it, ex, almost exclusively or almost, you know, maybe with a couple exceptions is really about uh, loans and you doing a loan fund. That is a fine strategy. It just doesn't serve people at the lowest income. And then the third area is around how do you segment uh, um, a region? If it's a regional housing trust fund, how does Richland County assured that the resources that the county puts in come back to the county? Or how is Columbia assured that what the city puts in comes back to the city? And so that's a, that's a structural challenge where um, uh, there's, I think, a couple different ways you could approach it. Uh, I certainly think um, scripting how the money would come in from the city or the county to the trust fund with specificity about the income levels, about um, the grants and loans, and about where those resources could be used. Is, is certainly one way that would also uh, uh, require, uh, um, you know, the, some shifts within Midlands to, in order to achieve that. So, um, so it's a potential, but it really, those structural issues need to be um, figured out before it actually is a match at this moment. That's my understanding. And Jennifer, I was just actually, before you came in, I was gonna jump in and just kind of give that history. So I, I know, uh, the way Midlands Housing Trust Fund was set up was kind of for that intent um, that started under uh, Mayor Bob. And, and I think just once he was, um, once he retired, there wasn't really a whole lot of regional cooperation on finding the supports for uh, Midlands Housing Trust Fund. And I was trying to look, doesn't look like Jeff is on this morning, but, you know, I, I think part of our task forces um, charge is to continue to look at all avenues and look at, you know, things that we need to recommend. And if there are things that need to be changed as well, that, you know, that certainly could be done. So I think from what I hear Michael saying, um, the income and the loan uh, is a more structural issues. That doesn't mean that 
that vehicle couldn't be used, but if you know it could, we would, might need to have some changes uh, to um, the way they were organized or, or their mission. So, and I, I hate to speak for Jeff because he's not on here, um, but I, I do know that that was part of the conversation initially. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, Michael, I don't know if you know, or, or Ivory may know since um, Greenville is her old, old stomping grounds, but how does Greenville, because um, you, you mentioned, I guess that's the only one that's functioning right now in South Carolina. How is that funded? And um, I was trying to look online. I just didn't see um, uh, uh, specifically like where they get their funds. Yeah, when I was, um, the fund actually um, was started when I um, was there in Greenville. It was, um, the housing uh, trust fund was a component of the uh, community works organization. And so what they did was they just revived that um, uh, trust fund and they created parameters around uh, targeted uh, areas, targeted um, individuals that they would serve under the trust fund. And the first, uh, so they hired a, um, an executive director who runs the trust fund. And they also, um, they received their uh, first allocation of funds came from um, the city of Columbia. I mean, excuse me, the city of Greenville. And then uh, they also received um, a small allocation of funds from a uh, philanthropic organization. And then they received a small uh, uh, allocation of funds from a church. And um, Cindy, you, you want to add any other information to that? No, it was the initial, the initial um, funding was um, general revenue funds from the city of Greenville. The city actually started the fund with um, $2 million that came from the city itself. And then they reached out and have expanded it more into philanthropic um, donations at this point. And so they have a lot of philanthropic funds that come into the, into the Greenville Housing Fund now. So that doesn't sound like it's a dedicated funding source, though. Right. It's not. No, it's not. It was a, it was a beginning funding source with the intent that they would then go out and find other funding sources to keep renewing it. Yeah. We just spoke to um, Greenville, and um, they uh, committed $4 million this year. To the fund the city committed city. additional they're, funds they're taking it from the general fund right they're, they're city general funds and they did indicate that the city would do that periodically but it's not set up that it's like an automatic annual renewal or anything it's as the city looks at its budget to determine what's available in in conversations that i was having um in Thank you both, uh, Cindy and Ivory. I, I think the Greenville story is a great one. And if you both played a part in it, um, congratulations. Um, I do think this allocation, this recent allocation of $4 million when the initial was $2 million, though, does underscore. Once you see what a trust fund is capable of, the appetite to do more increases. And so <clears throat> um, it is true that it's uh, neither dedicated or ongoing. It's periodic. But it's also, I think, important to note that doubling of what the public commitment would be. My initial conversations with, pe uh, with people from the city of Greenville and then the consultant that was working on the project, the initial concept was if the city put this first two million in, that philanthropy would match it, be like at that level. And, and that never uh, quite came to be. There's been good philanthropic uh, 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 contributions, but not at the intended level. But the results of the trust fund were as intended. And that's what I think spurred this next level of public investment. So especially, I mean, I, you know, going, I, I am talking a lot about the uh, American Rescue Plan. I just think it's such a marvelous opportunity to really kickstart something and, and demonstrate what is possible. And then that changes the parameters of the discussion of, well, how much, how much public money should we put in? Do we have to put in? Becomes like, look at the results we have. How can we do more of that? How can we make more of that kind of impact in our community? And that switch in the conversation is very key to the increasing of the resources that go into the trust fund. Right, well, thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Does anybody have any additional questions? 
And I know our, our uh, finance committee is looking at different things. Uh, trust fund um, is one of the things that they, they put on their um, list. And so having this level of detail is helpful as well. Thank you so much, Michael, we appreciate you. Absolutely, and I appreciate all of you too, uh, working through this and struggling for Columbia to be, to be what it needs to be a home for everyone who lives there. So thank you very much, best of luck. Thanks. Uh, Brenna and, um, well, as I said, Brenna and Jennifer, but I think Jennifer, well, both of you uh, do, I, I think that's the only um, committee that we had talked about that might have a report today. Do you guys have a report for us? We do, and I'm looking, I know Brenna had a meeting, so I think she might have already dropped Don't off. Know, yeah. we, we were messaging, sorry. Um, but we do, so we um, have the joint efforts of the community education and the partnership committee. Oh, there she is, hello. <laughs> sorry, I missed you. <laughs> um, so I'll start and then you you uh, please fill any gaps in Brenna. Um, but thank you to every member uh, the members of that committee and thank you for Brenna's leadership um, as well. Um, so what we've done is we have developed an outreach strategy that we'd like to start in the month of November. Um, focusing on uh, outreach conversations with neighborhood groups, targeted corporate or business community groups, um, or other just entities that we feel like um, could be one of two things, folks that could be strong advocates for the message of affordable housing, um, and then also folks that we may have, um, you know, perhaps some hesitancy or maybe some enhanced education efforts might be needed. Um, so we're thinking of using kind of the storytelling uh, approach, so folks um, can talk about what housing means to them personally or um, how they see it impacting the Midlands community. So obviously all of our different entities we think are going to have uh, different approaches. So if we are talking to um, a neighborhood group, we might be talking about the value of having quality affordable housing um, in that neighborhood. If we're talking to the business community, we might be talking about affordable rental to retain young professionals that we want to attract and keep in this area. So the messaging might be a little different for our different audiences, but still would ring true to that concept of the value of affordable housing that we all know and believe in. Um, so um, Brenna has set up a Google document that will circulate with this group soon uh, to get folks who would be interested in being a storyteller. Um, we know we have talented speakers out there, so we would love to have each and every one of you. Um, or if you could help us identify additional folks, that would be great to carry that message. Um, so we would like to start that soon. Um, the one thing that we really would love to have from the other subcommittees or maybe the full group is if we could get um, maybe uh, goals for affordable housing. Um, if there are specific asks that folks want us to make beyond just the educational um, aspect of it, because we, you know, it's our goal to get folks engaged in that conversation and become, you know, advocates, but then we do want to have that ask of them, what do we want them to do? you know, in support of the work here. So I guess if the other subcommittees can help us refine that, we would love if they would send us, um, you know, notes from their group or what they feel like those steps would be so that we can refine those talking points. Because we do want to have, you know, an individual approach from all of our storytellers because everybody has their own voice and their own story, right? But we still want to have some commonality about what that ask is um, so that we have consistency um, in the community. Um, I think that's where we are. What, anything I missed, Brenna? Nope, that's what I have to. Okay. So this input that you're seeking, and I know Brenna will send the uh, Google Doc um, mm -hmm. that you're looking at starting this in November, or are you asking for that input to come by November 1st or what? That would be great because what we'd love to do is go back and try to put that into some common like talking points that folks could use, again, tailored to the audience and the message that they have based on their own personal voice. Um, so we'd like to go back and then look at the, have the committee look at that for us. Um, I don't know if that needs to come back before this group or not. Um, so, so definitely, you know, folks let us know that because we want to make sure that what we are saying truly reflects the spirit of and the intentions of this group as a whole. Um, so yeah, but definitely if the committee, if the individual committees, um, like if the, for example, the finance committee is, is going to propose particular strategies that they think are important, to, for us to advocate on, we'd love, you know, just what those one, two, three, however many are. Same thing, the zoning and the legal. Um, I, mean, I know they had very specific things they were looking at around, um, you know, accessibility and, and, and land use policies and things like that. So if there's specific bullet points that you want us to include, that would be super helpful for us. 
Awesome, great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I would say, when you said goals, uh, I know we talked about like maybe in December, this group coming together uh, and setting like annual goals, um, maybe, you know, for 2022 and, and so forth. Um, since we are not there yet, is that what you're asking or to keep it more general right now because we don't have that information and data yet? Yeah, I mean, we don't want to hold up the outreach portion. So if, if we could get, you know, those call to action items together, I think definitely the goals could be added later. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that would work. All right. Any questions for Jennifer or Brenna? Awesome. Thank you, ladies. Um, I know Lala Anna could not make it today. Um, and Sue, I think Sue could not make it either, but I don't believe they have a report. Um, Reggie could not make it, um, and I don't believe he has a report. Um, and then Julianne, I think, was going to try and make it. Julianne, did you make it? Nope. Okay. That's what I thought. So our other committees, I don't think, have reports. Um, so we are right at 12 o'clock. Um, is there anything else that anybody has any questions about, anything you're working on that you want to give some announcements on? Um, I know, um, let's see, I'm trying to look. I don't think, I don't think they're here either. Any, any, anything else for the good or? Okay, nothing else there. I will just say um, thank you guys. Our next meeting will be in November. Um, I did hear from um, from Reggie that finance, I think, will be having some kind of input um, for next meeting and then legal and zoning may as well. Um, I do, I think, since I got the email, I will uh, be um, remiss if I didn't say, um, for our group here, we have been blessed to have Mr. Wright as the, the legal beagle from the city on, um, on all of our meetings. Um, and he is now um, going to be transitioning and uh, no longer with the City of Columbia City Attorney's Office. Uh, but I'm assuming um, possibly that he'll still be working with us. Um, if if Patrick, do you want to say anything? Thank you. He's always on these meetings, y'all, to give input and he's taking notes and making sure that as we move forward on the legal standpoint from the city, it's very important. Um, but Patrick, you want to say something? Right. Well, I know um, currently you're my councilwoman and then councilwoman Terracio has been on here. She just, I think, dropped off, but she will be my councilwoman uh, since I'll be with the, uh, the new county attorney for Richmond County. So still involved, still trying to take care of the citizens of Columbia and Richland County. Uh, so yeah, I'll still be, be involved. <laughs> so of course, from the city of Columbia standpoint, we hate to lose you, but I'm excited about you being county attorney, uh, especially what, as we're talking about this and regionalism and, you know, Councilwoman Teresia is as passionate about these issues as I am. So I think having that bridge um, because there will be a lot of things that the city and the county will have to work together on to move these issues forward. So having uh, that continuity with you will be amazing, but thank you so much for always being on these meetings uh, and, and giving your legal advice when we need it. No problem, you're welcome. All right, well, if no one else has anything, I see a bunch of congratulations in the chat. <laughs> Uh, but if anybody else doesn't have anything, we will see you next month. Thank you, guys. And um, thank you, Jim, for uh, bringing Mr. Anderson to, um, to our presentation today. It was a lot of great information. All right. Y'all have a great day, okay? Thank you.